So our, our speaker today is Patrick Brosnan from the University of Maryland, and he'll speak on uh, fixed points, toroidal compactification, and essential dimension of covers. Please go ahead. Hey, um, oh, thank you uh, for inviting me. Uh, so, um, the, uh, yeah, here's the outline of the talk. And I should say, I think Kirill has posted the PDF on the QFLAG yes. website. So if you, if you, um, if, if, I, if you want to go back a couple of pages, you can always ask me to go back a couple of pages, but if you want to go out back a couple of pages without asking me, you could like look at the <laughs> PDF or you could look at it later. Um, okay, uh, uh, essential dimension is a numerical invariant of algebraic objects invented in the 90s by Joe Bueller and Zoe Reichstein. So uh, this is actually from a, a Part, part of this is from a talk I gave to a more general audience, but I think it's worth repeating. So roughly speaking, the essential dimension of an algebraic object is the number of parameters it takes to define it generically. A recent paper of Benson Farb, Mark Kissin, and um, Jesse Wolfson, which I'm going to call FKW because what I do is a lot based on that paper, shows that it can be interesting to prove theorems about the essential dimensions, uh, essential dimension of congruent covers arising from Shimura varieties. varieties. Uh, this talk is about re recent work of mine with Najbuddin Sakhrudin, and our uh, goals were we have, we have three goals. So one is to give geometric proofs of the results of FKW, which were proved by purely arithmetic methods. So I'll say something about those methods, but maybe not a huge amount, but I'll say something. Um, we want, we also want to prove uh, results about non-classical similar varieties, in particular those of type E7, which are unobtainable using the methods of FKW combined with present technology. Um, the, the, the key words, the, the, there's a division in similar varieties between the ones of uh, Hodge type, but it's really the ones of abelian type, which is a little bit more general than Hodge type, and the one and the exceptional thing. The ones of uh, abelian type can more or less be embedded into the moduli space of abelian varieties. And so you can think of them in terms of AG. You have like a G, and there's a moduli interpretation for what they are. The exceptional ones. Uh, nobody knows the moduli interpretation of what they are in terms of varieties, and um, you can't stick them in the AG. Um, so we also proved results for reduction mod P of classical to more varieties. Uh, so for example, if I take AG and reduce it mod P, we can get new results for that. And for certain uh, quantum level structures and the moduli space of curves. So those are like exotic level structures on MG. Um, and we point out a general conjecture about essential dimension in Hodge theory. So the, it's like we have a general guess of what's going on Hodge theoretically. Um, okay, so I, I, I wanna remind everybody what essential dimension is. And I'm kind of following FKW here because like we, their, their framework, because the goal is kind of we're working in that work. So th uh, that kind of motivates a weird um, definition, <laughs> like starting from a weird definition. So suppose you have a, a, a generically finite morphism of quasi projective varieties like F from X to Y. And uh, I'm going to make this following kind of non standard definition. I'll say the pullback dimension of that morphism F is the minimum dimension of a variety W just fitting into a pullback diagram. So um, that's what it is. So in other words, it's the minimum dimension of a variety W such that F can be gotten by pullback from a morphism with target W. That's, that's what it is. And I, it might be totally useless in general, but you could use it to define a sense of dimension kind of in a semi-direct way. So uh, so the essential dimension is a, maybe a 
before I read the full slide. Let me say the essential dimension of a morphism F is essentially the pullback dimension over the generic point of Y. So now I, I'll write what it is. So su suppose for simplicity that X and Y are irreducible. The essential dimension of F from X to Y is, okay, they write it as ed F. It's the minimum of the pullback dimensions of all the, um, the maps from F inverse of U to U, where U is a, uh, is a risky open subset of Y. So you allow yourself to, to restrict F to any um, uh, like inverse image of an, a risky open subset of Y, and you take the pullback dimension of that and take the minimum. And then um, for a prime number P, the essential dimension of F at P is, so ed F colon P, it's the minimum of the pullback dimensions. But now here you don't go over the risky open subsets of Y, you go over um, covers V to Y or, or morphisms V to Y that are generically finite of degree prime to P. So if it was generically finite of degree one, then it would more or less just be a risky open subset, but here we allow things that are degree prime to P. And the essential dimension at P is something that seems to be much more computable than the essential dimension just full stop. So that, that's kind of the reason for introducing it. Um, now uh, in the talk, I'm gonna formulate a lot of things in terms of essential dimension, just for simplicity, but most of them hold for essential dimension at P. Um, for some particular prime. So the, the essential dimension of F from X to Y can be thought of the pullback dimension over the generic point, and the essential dimension of the map from X to Y at P can be thought of the pullback dimension of F over a prime to P closure of the function field of Y. So that, that I think is a good way to think about it. Okay. So it, a lot of the theorems here, like the optimal ones, are about incompressibility. So well, we say a morphism f from x to y is incompressible. Um, and maybe this should be a generically finite morphism. If the essential dimension of f is the dimension of y, and p incompressible of the essential dimension of f at p is the dimension of y. So like speaking a tiny bit vaguely, a morphism f from x to y is incompressible if there's no pullback diagram, like at the one I just drew here, like X to Y, and with kind of rational map to Z to W, where the dimension of W is less than the dimension of Y. So the map morphism can't be gotten by um, pullback from anything of dimension smaller than the dimension of Y. Okay, and then these, I have two slides just reminding you of like the history of essential dimensions since the 90s. So, and maybe also the prehistory. So both, most of the focus on essential dimension has been on essential dimension of groups, like both finite and infinite. And this is a number of parameters that it takes to define a G torus. When G is a finite group or a finite algebraic group, we can define it as follows. The essential dimension of G is a supremum of add X to Y where X to Y ranges over all G torsors. So if P, and similarly, if P is a prime number, the essential dimension of G, G at P is the supremum of all the essential dimensions of X to Y at P, where again, X to Y ranges over all G torsors. And since it's like kind of traditionally, it's the essential dimension of G that people were most interested in, you write essential dimension of G and the essential dimension of G at P for, for these things, for the essential dimension of G and the essential dimension of G at P. And then here, here are some examples. So the, the kind of classical from the paper of Reichstein and um, Bueller, Phil Bueller and, uh, and Reichstein. So the Babylonians basically knew that the essential dimension of S2 is one, and it's just that it takes one parameter to define um, Okay, a, a, a Z mod two torsor. Babylonians didn't think of it in terms of Z mod two torsors. They thought about it as quadratic extensions. 
but they knew, I believe they basically knew that it takes one parameter to define a quadratic expansion. Uh, and then it's classical that the dimension of, essential dimension of S3 is one, uh, and the essential dimension of S4 is two, for kind of similar reasons. It, it was classically known that it takes one parameter to define an S3 torsor, and I believe it's classically known that it, it takes two parameters to define an S4 torsor, or degree four extension. I'm copying these from the paper of Bueller and Reichstein. And then, <laughs> shamelessly. And then, uh, uh, I guess Klein and Joubert, like they basically computed the essential dimension of S5 and S6, but in that classical language. So that's some of the prehistory of essential dimension. And then the history is that Bueller and Reichstein showed that the essential dimension of A is R if A is a finite abelian group of rank R. And then um, they also showed that the essential dimension of Fn like sits between uh, n over two and n minus three, or least integer smaller than that, no, greatest integer less than n over two, less than or equal to n over two, when n is bigger than equal to six. And then Alex Duncan showed that the essential dimension of S7 is four. And then another kind of pretty important theorem that kind of pervades all this is um, the theorem of Karpenko and Mercure that if, if G is a, a finite P group, uh, and, the, and I, maybe I didn't write the, the, the field, let, let's assume that the field is P. The field has to contain enough P roots of units. So if G is a finite P group, and the, let's say the field is C, the essential dimension of G is equal to the essential dimension of G at P, and is equal to the minimum dimension of faithful G representation. But then there's a lot of stuff that's not known. So that, that's like the history, the kind of written history and the unwritten history is that we, we really don't know what the essential dimension of S n is for n bigger than seven. I guess it's probably n minus three, but no one knows. We don't know what the essential dimension of PDLP is. Uh, here, the, here the group is, out, is it's an algebraic group. It's not a finite group. Um, and then we don't know the essential dimension of Z mod P to the N over a field of characteristic P. It should be N by conjecture of let it, but that's still completely open. Okay, so um, how many I should, any, yeah, you can ask questions that way. I think, okay, so here's the Farb, Kissin, Wolfson kind of proto theorem. Uh, you take, you write AG for the moduli space of polar, principally polarized abelian varieties, which we call them PPABs, of dimension G, and AG bracket N for the moduli space of PPABs with full level N structure. So what that means is that AG bracket N parametrizes pairs consisting of a principally polarized abelian variety A and a symplectic isomorphism from H1 of A Z mod N to Z mod N to the 2G. Okay, and I hit a few lives in here. So you have to pick, a, if you have a polarization, a principal polarization, you get a symplectic form on this H1 group after you pick a P3 of unity. So let's say we pick a P3 of unity. And then you can just fix any symplectic form on Z mod N to the 2G. And so then that's the meaning of this isomorphism. Okay, for n bigger than or equal to three, AG bracket n is a fine moduli space. So otherwise, it's pretty, it's kind of not a great idea to think of AG bracket n. It's, 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 you should think of the stack. But if G is, if n is bigger than three, bigger than or equal to three, that stack and the the course mod, the, 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 the moduli space are the same. Okay, and anyway, here's the theorem of Farb, Kitson, and Wolfson. It's kind of the thing that it's all based on. Um, so you, you pick an integer n bigger than or equal to three and a prime p not dividing 10. And then you have this canonical, so forget the structure map. This, uh, so it's ag, pn goes to ag, n. That, so this is a map of algebraic spaces or stupid schemes. And the, the assertion is that 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 morphism is P incompressible. And 
Now there's something I didn't write, I should have written, but the, the group SP2G Z mod P acts on this. So it, it acts on the guy on the left and it makes this morphism into a SP2G Z mod P torsion. So what they're saying is that that SP2G Z mod P torsion is P incompressible or its essential dimension is the dimension of AG. So uh, the above theorem is, was proved by uh, arithmetic methods uh, involving the, the main, the, I think the main, well, I don't know if the main new advance for this, but one of the advances is understanding of, of integral models for AG and AG bracket N. And then the, the main techniques are, are something called Sarah Tate coordinates. And in the end, what it really is, is the, about the, well, it's about how the abelian how abelian how abelian varieties degenerate from characteristic zero to characteristic p, and what happens to the p torsion in the abelian variety, so the the ag bracket p, how that that subgroup of the abelian variety degenerates. So the method is it's extremely flexible, and it it generalizes to the case where the base uh, from the case where the base is ag bracket n. So the case where the base is, act, they can kind of take any variety inside of, or even finite over AG bracket N, which has suitably good reduction mod P. Basically the reduction mod P has to be um, smooth. It kind of has to have good reduction mod P, but it only needs to have that generically on Z. So really you, just need to make sure that the reduction mod P is not um, multiple. It's basically reduced. As long as you have that, then kind of you're good. Um, okay, from that, uh, Farb, Kiss, and Wolfson get the following generalization. So here's maybe the first theorem that kind of easiest to state. So with the notation of the previous theorem, but with MG, the modular space of genus G curves, the morphism um, from MGPN to MGN is also P incompressible. So here, um, with the, when you put a level structure on a curve, it's basically the same idea as for, uh, as it's, it's really the same thing as putting the level structure on the Jacobian. So, um, the level structure on a curve consists of like a, an isomorph, a symplectic isomorphism from H1 of the curve to Z mod N to the 2G. Um, and then, uh, so, so, and they get this by just embedding the, so that it's not technically true that MG embeds into AG, but it, it's a double cover onto the image and that, that's okay for them. So, um, so, uh, so to avoid technical details, I want to give a vague form of the next theorem, but it's, uh, um, it's actually the form that I'm going to be most concerned with in the rest of the talk. But the, the same type of P incompressibility holds for various Samora varieties of Hodge type. So the thing is, if I tell you the list of what the various ones of Hodge type that they do, it, it's kind of take a long time. And I think I would probably make a mistake, but essentially it, this theorem helps them win as long as they can get the Samora variety to embed in AG. Okay. Uh, so that, and that's the last thing. Okay, so now here's the, um, kind of description of my work with uh, uh, with Fakhrid. Um So our goal was to, uh, well, our goal it really started by a suggestion of Zenobi. So Zenobi uh, suggested <laughs> that we recover, uh, that you could, might be possible to recover the theorems of FKW by geometric methods um, using the, uh, this thing called the fixed point method, which I'll explain below. Um, so it, this is a, a general a kind of classical method. Classical meaning I believe it, go, it goes back to the early papers on essential dimension. Uh, I think it might even, 
go back to Bueller and Reichstein. But, but, but anyway, it goes back really far. So, uh, is it classical no, no. method? Oh, uh, Houston. Uh, Reichstein Houston. Reichstein Houston. Okay, yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah, cool. So, uh, um, it's a it's a general cl classical method for proving incompressibility of a G torsor f from x to y by finding uh, fixed points for an abelian subgroup of G in a suitable compactification of X. Okay, um, so that, that's so that's what we have to do. So now let me tell you kind of vaguely what we do before I give you too much information. Uh, so for for locally symmetric spaces, just, I'm kind of using that term synonymously with Shimura variety, um, even though that's wrong, but it's approximately right. For, for locally symmetric spaces, we prove P incompressibility of congruence covers whenever the associated Hermitian symmetric domain is a tube domain with the zero dimensional rational boundary component. So that's, based, that's where we, we win for tube domains with zero dimensional rational boundary components. So, uh, so um, with our method, um, okay, we recover the results of FKW for AG. It's because um, the Siegel upper half space, that guy that's the Hermitian symmetric domain that's associated to AG is a tube domain and it has rational boundary components. We also can extend the results to certain Shimura varieties uh, okay, I, I wrote, there are certain ones that are really nice of type E7 that were studied by Walter Bailey. They have, they have a nice, pro, the, let me just leave it at that. There are certain ones that are really nice. They have some kind of good reduction everywhere. So these, these are not of Hodge or even abelian types. So if the, if the group associated to the Shimura, variety, Shimura datum is of type E6 or E7, then it can never be uh, Hodge type. Um, and those are the only two exceptional groups that can be part of a uh, Shimura datum. We recover the results of FKW for MG. And then for both AG and MG, in finite characteristics, we can prove incompressibility. Um, okay, and um, we can also prove uh, uh, incompressibility for certain quantum covers of MGN. I, I already brought that up. However, and this is like the big however, like I should underline that, but that's why I put it in bold. So FKW works for many compact Shimura varieties, and our methods can't possibly work there because we need to go to the boundary to find fixed points. And if there is no boundary, we can't find any fixed point. So there's a similar situation that uh, um, it occurred in an appendix to paper of Coyote Land by Gobber. If you try to, you, could, you can look at covers of a, an abelian variety just by itself. Like for example, just multipli multiplication by N from an abelian variety to itself, you can ask, well, is that incompressible? And Dauber has some results that, that at least imply that generic for a ge generic abelian variety is actually, I think he actually looks at products of elliptic curves. So he looks at kind of a generic product of elliptic curves. He can prove that that's incompressible. Nasrudin, um, a student of Nasrudin, so Fakhruddin and uh, a student are about to post a paper. Sort of, and, proving in more generality that that multiplication by n map is incompressible. So that, that's another case where the variety is compact. There's no way to get six points. Um, so, and in that case, the FKW method uh, seemed to be the way to go. I mean, so, um, okay, similarly, we can't prove incompressibility for E6 type Shimura varieties, which are not cubed. And for these, incompressibility is open. So the, the problem there is that you have a boundary, but the thing, but when you do the, the toroidal compactifications of the boundary, which is what we really are looking at, the, 
the smallest dimensional fiber is not a point. It's a, the smallest dimensional strata is not a point. It's a, like an abelian variety of dimension in life. Either eight or 16, I forget. But we, we just can't have, we don't know how to handle that. Um, okay, so now I tell you what the, I kind of do a review of the fixed point method. And this is with, with I hope, correct attribution. Uh, so I, I think the fixed point match method in the form of Reichstein and Houston and also Gilles and Reichstein. And for this, uh, G is a finite group and F from X to Y is a G torsor. X bar is a G equivariant partial compactification of X and P, D is a prime. And H is a, it's just Z mod P to the R for some R bigger than or equal to zero. And I'm assuming that H uh, is a subgroup of G. I forgot to write. And I'll also work over C, or at least you need to work over a field where P is invertible. Um, so, okay, so, so let me just, since this was a lot, let me remind you. We have a G towards our X to Y, and we have this subgroup H of G. And uh, the theorem is that well, you, so you suppose that H has a smooth fixed point on this on the compactification X bar, then the essential dimension of F is at least R. So if we replace uh, uh, the essential dimension of F at P by the essential dimension of F, uh, then the theorem is not too difficult to prove once you know um, one more result of Reichstein and Houston, Houston that's, um, and, and also that, that it, whose proof I really take from the appendix, which is by Kola and Zabo. And I, I'm gonna, I like it. So I'm gonna, I, I think Gilles and Reichstein, it, it's, it's, they prove the, the statement with the essential mention at P. And uh, the statement with just the essential mention is Reichstein and Houston. Okay, but anyway, here's the going down theorem, which I, I really like. Uh, Perhaps you want to say that H is a subgroup of G. Yeah, I said it, but I didn't mind it. Yeah, I said it. I just, yeah, I did. Say, yeah, but I'll say it again. H is a subgroup of G. I can't. I, I could. Um, yeah, H is a sub. Otherwise, this won't make sense. <laughs> it's the bad thing about slide talks. You can't. I mean, yeah. OK, so um, so here's the going down theorem. Suppose that H is Z mod P to the R, and F is a rational map of H variety with X with Y proper. Then if H has a smooth fixed point on X, it also must have a smooth, uh, have a fixed, not a smooth, it also must have a fixed point on Y. So you can't kind of get rid of that fixed point by taking a rational map. And I, I just really love the proof, so I tell it. The, so it's, you kind of induct on dimension. So it's obvious that the dimension of X is zero. I think it's also obvious that the dimension of X is one. But if the dimension of X is bigger than one, then you can just blow up a smooth fixed point P and you get an exceptional divisor that's like P to the dim X minus one. And then, well, since it's smooth, you can extend the rational map. So you get a, I wrote birational. I shouldn't have written by You get a rational map. That should just say rational from E to Y. And then uh, the H uh, is gonna have a smooth fixed point on E just because so of the, you kind of know everything about how H acts on the projective space because it's all determined by the way H acts on the tangent space of the smooth fixed point. So then you're you're done by induction. Okay, I don't know that might have gone too fast, but it, I mean, it's a pretty simple thing, and it it's not too hard to see that it implies the at least if you remove well it, it implies this if you remove the at P. Okay, so here is our idea, like kind of our initial idea for producing fixed points. Um, so our initial idea to produce fixed points in compactification of locally symmetric varieties was to use the kind of the toroidal compact compactifications of Ash, Mumford, Rappaport, and Pi. So I'll just abbreviate that to AMRT. So, um, 
say this. So what they what they do is they um, they they kind of view the uh, the the, the Samora variety as like a, a as locally analytically being like like being a thing that's sort of like a tourist and the, and the, the and then you try to compactify it just the same way you compactify toric varieties with the, by fans by means of fans so um, the problem is it's not it's only locally analytically a torus there's there's not really a torus involved so this works when there are zero dimensional strata in the toroidal compactifications, or equivalently when the domain is a tube type and there are zero dimensional boundary, rational boundary components. So roughly speaking, the reason is that then the torus T, which is compactified to produce the toroidal compactification has rank R equal to the dimension of the Shimura variety being compactified. So um, it has rank R finite subgroups H, which necessarily fix the zero dimensional strata. And this like roughly speaking is really easy. It's just like if, if I have a torus acting on uh, say a proper toroidal compactification, then it's gonna fix the zero dimensional strata. So any subgroup of the torus would fix the zero dimensional strata. So, but you have to be careful here because the the torus doesn't, it's just an analytic object. It doesn't really exist. It does, there's no actual algebraic torus acting on the toroidal compactification. But those finite subgroups, they are algebraic objects and they do act. So at least a suitable one. So um, at least some of them. So that, that's the kind of rough idea. So basically, very roughly, uh, the way we find the fixed point is we just find the, the fixed points of the torus and those are the zero dimensional strata. Okay. Um, but after a lot of fighting the paper two different times, uh, of two rough drafts of the paper, we kind of found that it might be nicer and more general to abstractify the toroidal compactification part of AMRT that we were using with a general theorem about um, toroidal singularities and fixed points. Um, and that, that's helpful in, even in cases where it, it was very helpful for MG. So MG, MG and don't have a toroidal compactification that at least not in the language of AMRT, but you can uh, apply uh, a, this, this following fixed point theorem. So I wanna explain that theorem. So uh, first off by, by a toroidal singularity S, we mean the completion of the local ring of a toric variety at a torus fixed, that should say torus fixed point. Um, and then we write S, S naught for the complement of the boundary divisor. And having said this, I should say that the most important toroidal singularity that we care about is the one that's not singular. You just take uh, the origin in AN, you take the completion of the local ring there, and then that you call that S, and then you, the, the S naught is just S minus the boundary divisor. S minus the coordinate hyperplane. So that, that's, that's the one that we really, uh, we, we could do basically everything in the paper just using that one. Um, okay, so anyway, here's our theorem. Suppose F from X to Y is a finite Italic cover in which the Galois group, with Galois group G. And suppose <clears throat> there exists a map from S naught to Y, such as a composite, so pi one of S naught, pi one of Y to G is a finite abelian uh, group A. So I should have said the image of the composite, sorry. So it's the image of the composite. So let me just explain, like, if we have G from S naught to Y, then of course we get a map on the fundamental groups. But then uh, <clears throat> since X to Y is a finite Italic cover with group G, pi one of Y acts on G, or acts on, or acts on the cover and so it, it maps to G. Okay, 
And suppose G extends to a morphism G bar from S to Y bar, where Y bar is some partial compactification of X. Then any G equivariant partial compactification X bar of X emitting a proper morphism, so from F bar, F bar from X bar to Y bar has an affix point. <clears throat> so I'm gonna draw a picture, the, I drew a picture of this because I realized that it's kind of hard to parse in words. But uh, before I hit you with the picture, let me just um, let me just uh, say like what what we're what we're going to use this for is just to well to produce fixed points in some compactification of X. So <clears throat> oh, excuse me. So so we all kind of already we always know that we can find some compactification. So um, like this, we yeah, this theorem will produce a fixed point. Um, okay, so here's here's the um, here's the picture. So we have x to x bar, y to y bar. So those, those are the maps here, and then g is acting on x, and then and this this guy here, this x to y, we're we're assuming that's a, a <clears throat> but g is acting freely on x. So this is like a, a um, like a g torus. And um, this x bar, to, uh, the the map from x bar to y, g is not acting freely, uh, but it's it's acting it's acting on x bar, and it's, uh, the action on y bar is trivial. Um, and then we have this f naught going into y by g, but we assume that we can like compactify it. So the 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 things that are really the example that's really important is that we take s bar to be the Really, if you think about it geometrically, you think of S bar as the uh, the puncture disk raised to some power R. Um, so really, it's the local ring at the origin in A R uh, in affine R space completed at the maximal ideal, and then S S. Uh, and the, uh, uh, with a so S on is where the coordinate hyperplanes removed, and then S is that whole thing. Okay, so um, so we assume that X to Y uh, is this G Galois cover, and the image of pi one of S naught and G is the abelian subgroup A, and we assume the existence of the commutative diagram, so this whole commutative diagram on the left. Then A has a fixed point in S bar. And um, you know, I, I just want to note that S and S naught, they're not, we're going to apply it in the case where S and S naught are not like algebraic varieties, but they're like spectra of local, of completed local rings. Because um, that's what we get of geometry. Um, but, anyway, uh, but maybe one more thing I should say to, to prove the theorem. The proof of the theorem is actually strangely similar to the proof of the going down theorem. So it's kind of harder to say than it is to prove actually. And it, it, the main idea is really the same as the main idea of the going down theorem. So essentially what you do is you pull this whole situation back to S naught, and then you play with it there and kind of use the going, you use the idea of the going down theorem. Okay, so here's now, unfortunately, now I have to tell you, there, there's a lot of data going into Hermitian symmetric spaces that I kind of have to tell you to point out the application. So we're gonna apply the theorem in the case where uh, X to Y is a cover of locally symmetric spaces. So, uh, okay, so I, I'm just gonna start with some of that. Uh, Notation. So, the, my notation for a, a Hermitian symmetric domain is like D. It's G mod K. So here, G G is not the same G. It's not the finite group G like before. G is some um, it's some algebraic group. I, I'll take it over some real algebraic group, but it's supposed to be defined over Q. And G R to be absolutely honest. So the G I write here is a, a connected component of the identity in GR. 
K is the maximal compact subgroup of that. And then G mod K is a Hermitian symmetric domain. And the, the case to really think of is use like SL2R mod uh, SO1. It's about SO2, SO2R mod SO2. That that's gives you the upper half plane. Um, gamma is an arithmetic subgroup of G. And then uh, we want a congruence cover. So we take gamma prime to be a normal subgroup of gamma. And then um, gamma mod gamma prime will act on X, which I define to be just gamma prime mod D. So just take that D and I mod out by gamma prime. And then the morphism X to Y that I want to consider is, is just a map um, from D mod gamma prime to D mod gamma, just kind of mod out by more stuff. So uh, we need a compactification of that guy Y. So, and we don't, the good thing, if you look at this theorem, we don't, we never said that that compactification Y needs to be smooth. Um, so, uh, like Y bar we take to be the Bailey Burrell compactification of Y. That's like a canonical thing that'll compactify Y and the, it's, it's, yeah, so it's a canonical thing that'll do that. So then S is one of the following to a very similar, maybe almost the same object. So you could take it to be a poly disk uh, equipped with the period map. So, um, so my, my, my symbol for the, the unit disk, the open unit disk in C is delta. So delta the R is like the poly disk. And um, if you, I, for various reasons, I call it a period map, uh, a map from delta star to the R to Y, whereas your delta star is a punctured poly disk. So uh, by theorem of Borel, that always extends to a, uh, a morphism from delta R to Y bar to the Bailey Borel. So every morphism, every holomorphic map from delta star to the R to the Bailey Borel always extends to a, a, a map from the poly disk. So that gives us the, this thing gives us the S naught, and this thing here gives us the S. So it just comes from Borel's theorem. The other thing you can do is you can use the Ash Mumford, the AMRT technology, and you, you just take uh, S to be a toroidal neighborhood in the AMRT compactification of Y. Um, so you, re you replace the Y, that, that thing sits over the Bailey Borel. Um, Okay, so and then here's our theorem, which is need a little bit more data to define it or what. So in the situation above, the so rational boundary components of S, so they, there's like a group theoretic way of saying what you have to add a, to, to D mod gamma to make it compact. And those are, um, those strata are index, they're strata indexed by these things called rational boundary components. They're one-to-one -one correspondence with maximal parabolic subgroup P of G. So, you, so they could be maximal with respect to G, the rational structure or the real structure. It doesn't actually, uh, uh, maybe, maybe take a moment. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So, because uh, they're rational, yeah. So you write U equal U of F to the center of the unipotent radical at P. So that guy is somehow controlling the abelian subgroup that I'm going to get. And then uh, I, I just, we write blackboard bold U for U mod gamma intersect U mod gamma prime. So that's some abelian subgroup of gamma mod gamma prime. And then here's our theorem. So one is uh, U has a fixed point on any compactification of D mod gamma prime. And uh, and then the second part is of your fixed fix gamma. Uh, if D is tube with zero dimensional rational boundary component, then we can always find a gamma prime normal and gamma a finite index, such that the rank of this U is equal to the dimension of D. So consequently, because this guy has a fixed point and because the rank is a dimension, the the gamma mod gamma prime towards the uh, yeah, D mod gamma prime to D mod gamma is, is incompatible. And in fact, 
uh, we, we can get it to be P incompressible. Okay, now I think right before this talk, I realized that I deleted, so, so, yeah? Where, where is the prime P here? The prime P, so if we, we can always get it, so this gamma mod gamma prime has like, in, is, 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 a, is Z mod P to the N, basically. Ah, I see. We can arrange so, so, that. So you, you localize some, uh, somewhat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we might have to change gamma, but we can, but not D and uh, all that stuff. So, yeah. Okay, so before I gave this, like 10 minutes before I gave this talk, I realized that I kind of, when we were thinking about this, we all kind of thought about it in terms of AG, but then I, you know, then we want to prove the general theorem. And so we took all that out, but uh, so I decided to write it. But I did, so I did, you know, I, it was only 10 minutes before the talk. So I didn't write as much as I should have. So for AG, in, in that case, the group involved with that is that P2G. The, the, the parabolic, the maximal parabolic that corresponds to the um, zero dimensional boundary component is, is a, I think it's um, called the Ziegel parabolic. I think people call it that. And it's the one that, I'm writing in blocks for SP2G. So these are G by G blocks. It's one that looks like star, star, zero, star. That's not super important for us. What's important is that the unipotent radical, it looks like matrices are the form 1A01, where A is a symmetric G by G matrix. Okay, and then I'll say what I didn't write. I, mean, I actually have blank pages and I can write, but I think it's okay to say this. So the rank of this group is the rank of the G by G symmetric matrices. And that is, uh, I believe, G plus one choose two. So G times G plus one over two. And that's exactly the dimension of AG. So what that, that, then if you go back to this theorem in that case, what it's saying is that, uh, that, that you know, if you, choose gamma and gamma prime, you can get this blackboard bold U to have the same rank as U. I mean, this, this U is a, it's a, as, as a group, right? It's just a group of G by G symmetric matrices under addition. So it's really just like Z to the G plus one choose two. So we can get this, if we choose gamma and gamma prime, right? We can get this group here to be Z mod P raised to the g plus one choose two and then saying that it has a, a smooth fixed point in uh, a compactification tells us that the uh, the central dimension of the congruence cover is just g plus one choose two so it shows you that it's incompressible so what i didn't write here is this, this proves the incompressibility for ag okay now uh there's like a challenge that takes up some part of FKW and it, it kind of takes up some part of our paper too. Uh, and that is this, so suppose you're given, somebody hands you the Termitian symmetric uh, domain G mod K and maybe suppose because people like to think about uh, absolutely almost simple groups that G is simple. G is absolutely almost simple. Uh, what you want to do is to find a gamma prime, normal and gamma, such that this guy, which I'll call blackboard bold G, gamma mod gamma prime, is a finite simple group of Lie type with the same type as G. And this gamma prime, this D mod gamma prime to D mod gamma is P incompressible. Suppose you want to do it. Like for AG, the cover that, uh, that I had at the beginning, the AG bracket PN going to AG bracket N. That is a, a, an SP2G Z mod P cover. So it has the same type as the group SP2G that, that, that defines the, the group that's associated to uh, the AG. And, and then FKW proved that it's P incompressible. And then this argument 
that I just gave above also produces the key incompressible. So um, FK and W, so Bob Kitson will they answer this challenge in the arithmetic case using a modification of a theorem of Borel and Harder on the surjectivity of the map. So you can, you can take the, um, the forms of G over Q going to the form of G over like a finite number of QPs. So, so you get a map H1 Q ought G to H1, the product over some finite number of places, H1 QP ought G. And Borel and Harder proved that that's incompressible. And the, why that's useful is like, you wanna keep the infinite place of G to be kind of this thing that gives you the Shimura variety. And to get these gamma and gamma primes, you want to adjust the place at P. And you want to have a form over Q that gives you that proof. Because to get the Shimura variety in the rational boundary, if we get the Shimura variety, you need to, have, you need to have a form of the group over Q. So they need to know the surjectivity of this map. So we answer it kind of in a similar way, but it's a little harder for us because you see, for them, they don't need, for FKW, they don't need rational boundary components. So they, and they don't need to have maximal parabolic subgroups of G, but we, we need that. So what we do is we replace, uh, so we need to produce forms of G on the left-hand side over here that are as split over Q as possible. So that, that guarantees the existence of zero-dimensional rational boundary components. And for that, like luckily, there's a paper of Prasad and Sopinchuk that kind of tells you you can do that. And so we use that. Um, and so using this, we can find gamma prime uh, and gamma as above with G of type E7. So we can get a, a congruence cover of a, a Hermitian symmetric domain of type E7 where the, um, where the group associated to the congruence cover is a finite simple group of Lie type E7. And, and the, the whole thing is P incompressible. Okay, so maybe I tell you, I guess I tell you this. So there's a conjecture that I want to, I feel like I want to tell you. <laughs> so we have a conjecture about like what, what this all is about. Uh, and uh, the motivation is that um, some more varieties, the way you're kind of officially supposed to think about them is that they're parametrizing hard structures. They're like the moduli space of hard structures. Um, so uh, we want to think about this as saying that the, um, the dimension of uh, the essential dimension of a family of hard structures is really just the the, its dimension in moduli. So that's roughly speaking our conjecture, but I, I tell it to you here. So suppose H is a torsion-free integral variation of hot structure, a smooth connected quasi-projective complex variety B, and let B be the image of the period map. So the period map is the guy that just, it just says what the, um, it just maps to the moduli of hot structure. Then there exists some integer n uh, such that if p is a prime number and little n is an integer with like p to the n bigger than or equal to big N, then the essential dimension of H tensor z mod p to the n over p. So just that, that this is like a, once I tensor with z mod p to the n, this is basically a variety. So um, and this is like a finite cover of b. So the essential dimension of that at P is at least D. So roughly speaking, it's just saying that the essential dimension, the variation, when you tensor with Z mod P to the N is at least the dimension of the image. Okay, and here's the partial evidence. Like in FKW, you could just take H to be the canonical variation uh, in the case of AG and similarly in general. So our theorem, Prove it for except for E7, some more variety. Um, plus a fixed point theorem, can, we can use it to get a, a lower bound, but it's not this good. It's not saying it's the dimension of the image, but weaker. 
But then maybe the most impressive uh, piece of evidence is that, so Maronoi explained to us that if you don't tensor with Z mod P to N, then it's just, the conjecture is just true. And it, it follows from the, it follows directly from the theorem of the fixed part. Basically, uh, and maybe I won't repeat that argument because I'm kind of running out of time, but uh, there's a short argument to just prove that it's true. Um, so I think, I think I'll, I think I'm running out of time. So I'll, I'll maybe, I think I'll end. Yeah, I'll end, yeah. I'll stop. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? So if you go back to the challenge, um, yeah. what are you fixing there? Uh, is it G and P? Yeah, G and P. Yeah, we don't, we're not fixing. Uh, yeah, we're not, yeah, well, okay. We're fixing, no, in the challenge, no, we're not, I guess we're fixing G, R and P. But we're, the, we're allowing ourselves to use, so FKW are, are allowing themselves to use uh, Burrell hard, they have a modification of Burrell harder. They're allowing themselves to use that to change the form of G over Q. So what they wanna do is they wanna make it so that that form of G over Q, um, that's kind of good reduction at P. Um, I think the, the word is a, is a good word for it. It, it should be uh, unramified un at P. Um, uh, and then that, that allows them to get these gamma and gamma prime that uh, behave like this, where the, the gamma mod gamma prime is like a finite simple group of Lie type with the same type of G. The real word is like hyper, it has, they want G to be hyper special at P. That, that's a real technical word. Uh, they want to have a like hyper special reduction at P. And for us, we want G, so you, so you, you change G. You kind of, when you do that, you don't really have to think about gamma and gamma prime because as we change, uh, I don't know, what that hyper special reduction gives you, it, it, like when you think about it, you give, you give yourself gamma and gamma prime as part of that data. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but yeah, you, yeah. So really, you're just fixing G over R. Um, and then so for us, we need to know. In the case of abelian varieties, then this G is the symplectic group. Yeah, and the, see the the thing, what, the reason this challenge is not like super important for the AG is that uh, FP2G it has good reduction everywhere. So uh, I believe that's right. I hope I did. Yeah, I think it, and I think FP2G and E7 are two groups that not uh, that Bailey's E7 are two groups that have good reduction everywhere. It's kind of not super common. Um, and so, and you, and like now E7, it's kind of hard, like Bailey V7 is kind of hard to think about. Like, uh, it's like you have to read a long paper to think about it. But SB2G, like everybody knows what it is. So it's really easy to find the gamma and gamma prime. And that corresponds to finding some form of SP2G that has good reduction at P. But you just use SP2G itself. But if you're in a situation like E7, where you don't know what, what uh, an example of something that you know that has good reduction at P, then uh, you want to use a theorem like this. And if you're in, in type D and type A, they they use this theorem. It's like SP2G is like a really fortunate property. Property like type A, um, like uh, well, SLN has. Good reduction, I think, everywhere, but it's not doesn't correspond to a Shimura variety. The things that cause it's not in a Shimura data, except for SLT, SLT. 
Uh, G, uh, that's not right. GLT group, not F1 two, but uh, yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the ba basic thing is out outside of G of SPTG, there aren't ex a lot of cases where you don't need to use because you know, there are not not a lot of cases where you have like an explicit handle on what the group is. Are there other questions? So if not, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Hello?